I've just jumped off the tube at Tottenham Court Road and I've got to be honest, barely recognise the place. Wow. So much has changed. There's Oxford Street there. There used to be a tube entrance there, do you remember? Just about there. That's gone. And this one's still here. Wow. And who remembers the old tube entrance, which would have been about there, the old tube entrance. The old um, set of stairs that went down with the newspaper man at the top. It's gone. Still, in the words of James Mason, in that excellent documentary he done, the London nobody knows. In his words, we'd be foolish to mourn it too readily. Just about halfway along that walkway, just about where the yellow meets the green, that would have been number 143 Charing Cross Road, the Freddie Mills night spot. The Freddie Mills night spot opened in 1963. Prior to that, it was the Freddie Mills Chinese restaurant. Who was Freddie Mills? Well, in the 1930s and 40s, Freddie was known as Britain's biggest boxing idol. And after he retired from boxing, he became a household name celebrity. As a boxer, Freddie won the British, the European, the Commonwealth, and world light heavyweight titles. His final career stats are 77 wins, 55 of those wins by knockouts, a lot of knockouts, 18 losses, and seven of those losses by knockout, with eight draws. His notable fights for me would be the British and Commonwealth title fight against Len Harvey at White Hart Lane, Spurs football ground. Freddie knocked Len Harvey clean out the ring, uh, upside down, legs in the air, real shocker. Freddie's first fight against the American Gus Lesnovich was even more brutal, but this time it was Freddie who took a frightful beating. In fact, he got hammered so badly that night that he suffered headaches and dizziness for the rest of his life. And in the final fight of his career against the American uh, Joey Maxim, Freddie had three teeth knocked out. One tooth uh, ended up deeply embedded in the gum of his upper jaw. He refused to quit. There was no quit in him. They called him Fearless Freddie because that's what and who he was. After he retired from boxing, Freddie slotted effortlessly into the role of TV personality. He presented a BBC pop music show, there were radio shows, he featured in movies, the, the whole bit. On Saturday 24th July 1965, he left his home in South London, Denmark Hill, at 9.45pm and drove to the night spot. He pulled into Goslett Yard at 10.30 and uh, then someone killed him. He was stabbed or shot in the right eye. One of the night spot doormen found him sitting in the rear seat of his car with a rifle next to him. No fingerprints on the rifle, and no gloves on Freddy. And apparently there were two bullet holes in the front passenger door. Before the police arrived, an ambulance crew turned up and removed his body, took it away. They basically tampered with the crime scene. Verdict, suicide. Goslet Yard, a lot different now. Behind these hoardings there's a, a road. So Freddie would have driven up here, turned right here, and it's a uh, fenced off utility area now. In the far right hand corner is where Freddie was murdered. Goslet Yard. On the other side of the Charing Cross Road stands the Centre Point building, looking down on everybody. The whole area around Centre Point was once very much different. 
from the late 1700s to the mid to late 1800s, this area was a dangerous slum city. It was known as the Rookery of St Giles. In 1772, Lord William Murray Mansfield kind of declared slavery to be immoral and kind of hinted that it should be abolished. Britain carried on slave trading regardless, but the African slaves who were in London at the time, they got wind of Lord Mansfield's sentiments and they began to feel a sense of freedom. Slaves began slipping away from their masters in large numbers. A great many of London's runaway slaves ended up in the rookery of St Giles. A maze of narrow, dark passageways, a place of overcrowded squalor, derelict drinking dens and wild violence. The Irish were there in large numbers as famine took hold of their country. Highwaymen were there, wanted dead or alive. Not many policemen dared enter the rookery of St Giles. Pirates, thieves and murderers lived and died there. The runaway African slaves became known as the St Giles Blackbirds. People in London began to speak of the Black Problem. In 1780, a group of philanthropists and slave abolitionists set up the Committee for the Relief of the Black Poor. The committee distributed food and generally helped in any way they could. The committee was at one point in talks with the government to sort out a bit of land in Nova Scotia, Canada where freed slaves could establish their own colony, but nothing came of it. Then, in 1786, a businessman called Henry Smeathman got involved. He convinced the committee that he owned a plot of suitable land in Africa, and he put forward a plan for a self-sufficient freed slave colony. The committee offered Smeathman their full support. Smeathman wrote to His Majesty's Treasury assuring them that his scheme would rid London of its poor black problem in a compassionate manner. The government provided three ships, but before they set sail, Smeathman died. However, the committee pushed on with his repatriation mission. Handbills were circulated offering places on board the ships. Many African brothers and sisters jumped at the chance to get the hell out of London. Many others were sceptical. Some willingly jumped on board, some were persuaded, others were forced. A number of poor, vulnerable white Londoners were plied with alcohol and led on board just before the ships left dock. The three ships, carrying 100 settlers each, set off from Blackwall, East London, in February 1787. The number of settlers should have been 600, that's how many signed up, but 300 trusted their instincts. And stayed in London. The ships sailed straight into a violent storm. Illness and disease broke out on board and provisions soon ran low. The dead were thrown overboard and the terrible truth awaited the survivors. They arrived in Sierra Leone at the height of the rainy season and there was no suitable plot of land waiting for them. They disembarked into barren swampland. The damp coupled with the furnace-like midday heat, soon led to more illness and death. Their only food was the meagre rations of salted meat that were left on board the ships, and rum, plenty of rum. The ship's staff stayed on board and eventually sailed away, leaving the desperate settlers to their fate. Many faced that fate in a drunken stupor. By March of the following year, there were only 130 settlers left and over the ensuing months death and desertion whittled that number down even further. Weary and desperate, settlers began making their way along the coastline to the docks. There they boarded slave ships bound for London and we can only wonder how many of them lived to break free again and end up back here in the rookery of St Giles.